So the first slide, you know, we are lawyers. We just want to have this disclaimer up there for you. This is for general information and general overview. Uh, if anyone has specific questions or anything like that, they can always reach out to us um, for that kind of information. But we just want to make sure you know this isn't intended to be legal advice as to any specific issue. Just something real quick for you guys to see. And uh, just for today, what we're going to have four goals really uh, in terms of what we want to be covering and what we want you all to walk away with. Um, we've got them up here, um, but just quickly, at the end of this, so that you will have a better understanding of some key uh, copyright concepts. What is copyright? Um, what's protected? What's not? Who owns it? How is it transferred? And some of the statutes that govern those issues. Um, also, keys, we're going to want you to be in a better position to avoid infringing um, somebody else's copyright and hopefully protecting your own copyright um, uh, moving forward. And last, we're going to want to make sure you have a basic understanding of the elements of a copyright infringement lawsuit and have an understanding of what the damages are or really the, the, the risk and potential exposure uh, that exists in um, infringing on copyright. So to start off, let's go over a few definitions. Let's talk about inspiration. Uh, the noun is it's an inspiring agent or influence, quality or state of being inspired, the action or power of moving, the intellect or emotions. It can be used in, in, as an adjective and when it's inspiring, it's having an animating or exalting effect. Something inspired, you have it's outstanding or brilliant in a way, um, or to a degree suggestive of divine inspiration. Something that isn't captured by these definitions, though, is that a lot of times when somebody's inspired, somebody's often compelled to also emulate what's inspiring them, um, and perhaps use some of the features of the, the object of inspiration. So let's take a look at a few um, inspiring architectural works here. Does anyone recognize this building? You can unmute yourself if you want, or not. Uh, this is the Frank Geary House in uh, it was, uh, initially remodeled in 1978. It has a very distinct um, style. And how about this one? It might inspire folks to dance. The Dancing House in Prague uh, is completed in 1996. I think most of you are going to get this one, which is Falling Water in Pennsylvania, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. And I suspect that this one looks familiar. And of course, it's the World Trade Center in New York. It was completed in 2014. But what about this one? It looks pretty similar. So this is a city front, is the name of the design. It was designed by a gentleman named Ji Hoon Park. And he actually claimed that uh, he designed the city front when he was in grad school uh, and that the One World Trade Center was actually a, a copy of that. And that one of the, his advisors was actually working at the firm that uh, helped design the One World Trade Center. So this is really getting to the issue today, which is... <clears throat> it's inspiration or infringement. I mean, that's really the question. You can't unsee a building once you've seen it. And, you know, we all see things as, as we just live our daily lives, especially as you guys study architecture. You spend a lot of time studying different buildings, studying different designs. Um, at what point... Does something go from I was inspired by something versus oh I'm infringing on a copyright? Um, it, it's a really difficult question, and and that's kind of what we're going to get into here today. Is that at the end of the day, it becomes a very very subjective kind of analysis. Fundamental question: infringement of what? What are we talking about here? Uh, and it's architectural copyrights, and this is. This is the definition from the statute, the design of a building. And the important phrasing is as embodied in any tangible medium or expression, including a building, architectural plans or drawings, 
uh, the work includes not only the overall form as well as the arrangement, the composition of how things fit together, but it's important to remember it doesn't include individual standard features, and we'll get into a little bit of details. So what rights are actually included in a copyright? Um, as you can see, the owner of the copyright has the exclusive. They're the only person that can reproduce and copy the work, make derivative works, or distribute this work to other people, to other places, to other businesses through gift, lending, or sales. So any design ideas subject to copyright? Well, not exactly. So we've got to really zero in on certain parts of this definition. You'll see here there's a highlighted and underlined uh, portion which says, as embodied in any tangible medium of expression. So, in other words, the design has to be put into some sort of tangible form. Um, it's, you know, just because you have the idea floating around in your head doesn't mean that it's going to be subject to copyright. The, another key thing to take away is that the copyright in the work um, protected under this statute it vests initially in the author of the work. And we're going to go over a few key exceptions here, but you can kind of think of it as uh, first person who gets the right is going to be the author of the work. Um, so what it means is the moment you create the work, you're going to... Uh, and let's move on to another key aspect of this definition which is that tangible mediums include a building, architectural plans, or drawings. Um, and in terms of what you own and what's actually protected, and we'll get into this into a little bit more detail later on, uh, it's the overall form as well as the arrangement and the composition of spaces and elements in the design. But as Jason mentioned, it doesn't include individual standard features. Uh, so, for instance, you might have, let's use the falling water example. Obviously, from the outside, that design is distinct. You see it, it's the overall form um, is something that's going to be subject to copyright. But it's a little bit for to um, perhaps a grasp is that it might be the actual arrangement of something on the inside. So, a building may look generic from the outside, but there may be a unique um, arrangement of the rooms for a particular purpose, let's say for a hospital or um, you know, a warehouse. Those aspects are going to be subject to copyright, or maybe I should say. Um, but what's more important is that you're, not only are your plans and drawings protected, but the building itself is a tangible um, expression of the design. So this is a fundamental question, who, who owns it? Uh, initially, ownership uh, belongs to the author of the work. That, that's pretty simple to understand, but there are a couple things we always want you guys to watch out for. Um, and that's work made for hire and contract language that shifts ownership. And we'll get into this in a little bit more detail. So you guys are probably familiar with this term, a work made for hire, it applies in, in two different circumstances. The first is, is pretty self-explanatory. Um, it's anything that's made by an employee in the course of their employment for an employer. Um, that work belongs to the employer. Uh, the second situation is if there's a written agreement between the parties where one person is doing work for the other, it creates a pretty similar relationship to the employee-employer relationship where the person performing the work, doing the design, it isn't going to own it isn't going to own the copyright. It's going to belong to the person that they contracted with. So take a look at this house. This house was designed by an LA architect by the name of William Hablinski. Um, and then take a look at this other house. This was a house that was designed, and I use that term in quotes, former employee Hablinski's, and he sued him. Uh, because as you can see, these designs are pretty similar. Um, so after a lengthy lawsuit, he did win, uh, but it wasn't a foregone conclusion. So what do you look out for in contracts um, so that you're always aware of who owns the copyright? 
whether it be you as the designer or whether it's being transferred or some, somebody else's to begin with. All right. So these are the key terms that we always want you to be aware of, you know, when you're looking through agreements, uh, when you're performing work, because um, these have a lot of ramifications and consequences as to copyright. All right. The first provision is, as we said, work made for hire. We've already explained that pretty clearly, I think. Um, the second is language that creates an assignment or a transfer with regard to ownership. And the last would be language dealing with licenses. So some examples of work for hire which we've thrown up here. Take a look at the first one. Uh, with respect to any consultant documents and materials that may qualify as works made for hire, as defined in the statute, such documents and materials are hereby deemed works made for hire for the city. Or where applicable architect and the work produced by architects shall be deemed a work for hire as that term is defined under copyright law. So what's the result? You likely don't own the copyright. Here's some examples of some assignments or transfer language. And these, I think, actually are a little bit trickier. Um, so let's take a look at the first one, which is going to be an example of um, a, uh, a transfer here. Uh, after completion of the design development phase and after client has made all payments under the agreement, the instruments of service become the client's property. And I think the word here, um, the consultant hereby transfers ownership of the instruments of service to client. So in this instance, if this is in your contract, you likely don't own the copyright um, under this provision. And the second one's a little bit trickier and may not be completely obvious, but consultant hereby consents to the assignment of the contract to the subsequent third party purchases of the project. What this means is that the owner may have a license to use that um, those plans pursuant to the contract and for a particular project, but because of this provision, that owner can then assign it to subsequent buyer or um, you know, someone else of their choosing. Uh, so here, owner's gonna be able to have that right. So what are the key terms that you wanna watch out for, all right? Um, wanna watch out which is that explicitly copyright, that's self-explanatory. You also want to watch out very carefully for the right to reuse plans. Um, that's often language that people don't zero in on. They're looking for words like copyright, transfer, but you have to be aware of, of what that pertains to. Um, and everything, um, as we said, you want to be careful with regard to broad language that deals with copyright and uses words like assign, transfer, license. These may all shift ownership and your ability to own your design. So excuse the picture of uh, the Knight Rider right there, but we want to talk a little bit about licenses. Um, licenses, you know, it's a legal term, you know, with regard to permission to do something, but you probably don't realize how often you're dealing with different types of licenses, not just driver's licenses and ports, but really lift tickets or a ticket to a ball game, any of those things, um, they all represent licenses. They represent your permission to do something very specifically, and they usually come with a lot of disclaimers and a lot of conditions. So uh, copyright, for the most part, is governed by federal law. Um, they're federal statutes, as you saw, there's the USC code, um, and there's really little the state law um, touches on that. So lawsuits related to infringement, they're going to be filed in federal court. The issue of license, however, can be covered by some state law, um, but federal law does touch on some of those, um, some aspects of license. We're going to cover a few things here that um, are affected by, by state law in the next couple of slides. One thing to watch out for with regards to licenses, uh, you don't want if you want to watch out for exclusive licenses and perpetual licenses. An exclusive license, if you give an exclusive license, you can't use that work. Um, and then a perpetual license, you that license is going to last forever. And related to that, 
So the perpetual license, you often want to include something that um, allows you or specifies the termination of a license. And we'll touch on some of those or an example of that um, later on that's actually in some of the AIA contracts. Some additional considerations are two statutes um, that we're going to cover here. Uh, Education Code Section 17316, um, and this is a lot of text, um, but the key language here is that any contract with a is going to provide or shall provide that all plans, um, including but not limited to the drawing, specifications, estimates, shall be and remain the property of the school district for purposes of repair, maintenance, renovation, modernization, or other purposes. Keep in mind, however, um, Section B, which says that it doesn't transfer or waive the, um, the architect or structural engineer's copyright over the documents, unless, of course, they explicitly decide to do so. Um, and then the last thing to note is in Section C, which is that if, if the district decides to reuse the plans um, and gets another architect to do that work or to use those plans. The school's going to be required to, or the school district's going to be required to indemnify and hold harmless um, architects. That particular um, concept is going to come up later on. And if you're transferring a license, or, or sorry, if you're giving somebody a license or transferring rights to somebody else, that, you often want to couple that with an indemnity provision because who knows what a subsequent architect might do, what kind of errors or omissions uh, they might be liable for. And if there's a lawsuit, um, chances are someone's going to figure out that the original plan came from you and you want to have an indemnity uh, clause protecting you. So the next statute to consider, state statute, is the Business and Professions Code 5536.4. Um, and this one's pretty clear. No person may use an architect's instruments of service um, without the consent of the architect in a written contract, uh, written agreement, written license, specifically use. But check out uh, the Section B, which says that an architect's not going to unreasonably withhold consent to use those instruments of service from a person uh, for whom the architect provided the services, right? So if you've been hired to design for a project, um, you're not permitted to unreasonably withhold consent for the use of those plans. Um, that said, the architect can withhold consent if, for instance, they haven't been paid in full. And that's going to come up later on um, in an example that, or a hypothetical that we're going to go over. So we just wanted to touch now a little bit on the legal definition of what is infringement. Um, that's kind of the key concept here. Um, the legal elements of infringement are valid ownership. Um, so were you the original designer of you know, a specific plan or did you gain it via a contract transferred to you or left to you as a gift? Those are all elements um, of the first requirement uh, to prove infringement. And the second is simply copying. Did someone copy your work? And that sounds simple, but it gets pretty complicated. Um, one thing we did want to note is that intent and what the person intended um, is, is not actually very relevant. It's not an element here. So more on these elements. You know, ownership is proven by re registration. Like I said, it's proven on the documents. Were you the original owner? Do you have the necessary paperwork to prove that a transfer occurred, that a gift occurred, all those types of things? And copying is proven by a couple of different methods. The first is direct evidence. Do we have emails or communications where the infringer admits that they copied the plan? And the second type is, is pretty, also pretty self-explanatory. It's circumstantial evidence. Um, does this person have access? Do they work in the building in the same as the original designer? Uh, are they a former employee? Are they a close friend, a relative, that kind of thing? And then substantial similarity. This is looking at the specific projects. Um, I go back to that mansion that we were looking at by Hablinski, where we're talking about if you take a look at 
these two images, these two designs? Do you see the similarity? Do you see that one is basically the same as the other? So what is substantial similarity? You know, in, in a lot of ways, the answer is that it depends. All of this does end up being pretty subjective. Um, one of the things that we like to, to say is like, you kind of know it when you see it, you know? Um, I always use the comparison to like, uh, you know, a bootleg handbag or something. If you see something that says Prada, you know they meant Prada and you know it's a bootleg, you know they're infringing on some sort of copyright. Um, we just want to remind you, remind you what the statute says. Because it's important and to note that <clears throat> the key issue here is any tangible medium of expression. Uh, we want to always harken back to that language, and you'll see why. So the foundational questions as to what is protected and what isn't protected all just goes back to the, the statue we just pointed out. You know, the building is copyrighted. The basic issues that, that we want to always make sure that you're aware of <clears throat> is that there, copying constitutes an infringement when there is a substantial similarity between the defendant's work and the protectable elements and only the protectable elements of the plaintiff's work. Like, like we said, you will know it when you see it. And it's one of those things that does be difficult to decide. And that's problematic when we get into the legal aspect of it. So there's going to be two tests um, and infringement case. The first test is going to be by the court. This is going to be objectively considering whether uh, the two works share substantially similar ideas. Um, the second step is a jury question, and the jury is going to perform the intrinsic test and determine whether an ordinary observer, basically anybody, you know, just any potential juror, uh, would perceive the two works. Uh, that the two works express those shared ideas in a substantially similar way. Um, one thing to point out, too, is uh, that that first test is objective, but there's a, a decent amount of um, subjectivity involved there as well. Yeah, we just say that it's objective and name only. Like, both these tests, both the extrinsic and intrinsic test, ultimately are incredibly subjective. Um, this whole subject matter is. So that's just an important thing to remember. So what are going to be some of the unprotected elements? Uh, there are going to be standard elements, doors, windows, archways, hallways, walls. Um, those aren't um, unique elements um, or concepts, really. Um, then there's uh, aspects of the design that are indispensable. So, for instance, you're not going to be copywriting a roof as a concept on a house. Um, it's an essential aspect of the design. Let's take a look at the extrinsic stage. This is about excluding ideas and uh, unprotectable elements. So we're taking out what isn't subject to copyright. Um, something that's key to keep in mind, and I previewed before, was that the arrangement of unprotected elements can be protected. So, for instance, the example I gave before was rooms, the arrangement of rooms. There may be a particular design or arrangement of rooms that has a particular purpose, let's say, for a client, let's say a hospital or a warehouse, a dentist's office, and there may be some way that the rooms are arranged uh, that really did have a design component to it um, that was that's unique that isn't just um, room side by side. Expert testimonies frequently used to identify the different criteria and assist the court in this comparative analysis. Um, so take a look at this picture for a moment and then take a look at this other picture. And this is a recent case that comes out of New York. The architect created this home, the first one, Georgetown 2. 
and copyrighted their plan. Um, and then they created a brochure around this plan. Um, this case dealt with this second house and whether or not the second house represented, represented copyright infringement of the Georgetown II. Uh, the defendants made significant changes to the inside. Um, a lot of very notable changes. The two houses function differently in a lot of ways. But if, as you can see from the exterior, very little was done to the exterior facade of the home. The court granted summary judgment as to infringement. So once the court segregated the unprotected elements uh, from, from the, the design, the next step is going to be to, to determine whether the remaining elements um, of the infringing work are substantially similar to the protected elements of the plaintiff's work. Uh, and then the question really is, what would an ordinary reasonable person perceive about the two works. The Prada, Prada example that uh, Jason brought up is a good one. This is ultimately a jury question. You know, what would an average person, not an, not an expert, not somebody who knows this stuff inside and out, but the people who are sitting on the jury. So can coincidences happen? Yes, absolutely they can. Um, it's very possible that, you know, you, that looks like another architect's work. You know, like we said, people take inspiration from all sorts of different buildings and designs and things. A lot of um, architectural students are learning from the same materials, so on and so forth. Um, so coincidences can happen. But the, the key questions that we want you to keep in mind, did the potential infringer have access to the original work? And did they have a copy of the overall composition and the arrangement of the spaces of the other work. So then the next, oh, excuse me. The next question would be, how do I stop someone from infringing on my work? Well, the best practice is to register the work. If you don't register your work until after someone's infringed on it, then the damages you claim can be limited. Uh, and there's little chance of recovering attorney's fees. If you have different options for damages and a much higher chance of collecting attorney's fees. So really the bottom line is register the plans, um, typically at the end of the, the DD phase. Um, you can go to, to uh, copyright.gov to do so. So the next question or issue here that comes up is really related to a concept that I think people hear about, which is fair use. Folks might think, I'm fine if I make a few changes here and there to some plans. I should be okay, right? The answer is no. You probably aren't okay. Um, you, if you go back to the original slides or the earlier slides we looked at, the copyright owner has the right to make derivative work as well. So what's a derivative work? It can be a work that's based on one or more pre-existing works, such as a translation, art reproduction, any other form, uh, which can be recast, transformed, or adapted, or work consisting of editorial revisions, annotations, elaboration, or modifications, which as a whole represent an original work of authorship. So um, making tweaks to someone else's plans uh, would be a derivative work of the original plan. And it's risky to do that. And the bottom line here is what you're going to want is permission, like we talked about, a license to do so. Um, and that's critical. Uh, for instance, my, my wife works in publishing and they have whole departments dedicated to making sure they have permission to pictures that are being used in a way that they weren't originally intended to. Maybe they're making modifications, but you got to go out and you got to uh, get permission. Otherwise, you're running a risk of infringing on somebody else's work. 
just a quick example. Um, let's say a potential client comes to you and they want you to design a house and they've, they've scribbled some stuff on a napkin, some ideas for a floor plan. You take them on, you do a full set of plans based on those, those scribbles. And it turns out that that client got the floor plan idea and, you know, a lot of <clears throat> the stuff that was written on that napkin came from somebody else or another plan they saw. Unfortunately, you could be liable for infringing on the original architect's copyright. This is just a reminder. Intent is not an element of copyright infringement. Um, it doesn't matter that you didn't know. It, it all matters. Was something copied? And who was what was copied belonged to somebody else? Those are the two fundamental elements. So then what about damages? What might somebody have to pay if they've infringed? So this is when uh, registration becomes important. If the copyright is registered before the infringement, then the damages can be collected. That can be collected maybe different than if uh, the registration is after the infringement. If it's before infringement, the claimant has the choice of two of two damages, statutory damages or actual damages. So again, if you, if you register before, you just have options. You have more options to, to calculate what makes more sense. How do you recover more money against the infringer? Statutory damage, very clear by law, you know, an award of no less than $750 or no more than $30,000. Um, if the owner proves that the infringement was willful, the court has the ability to increase the award. That's important to note. And the infringer, if they are able to prove that they weren't aware and they had no reason to believe they were infringing, the court can reduce the penalty. So we've told you intent doesn't matter with regard to <clears throat> whether or not you infringed on a copyright, but the court can take that into consideration when they're determining statutory awards. One of the benefits of actual damages instead of statutory awards is that these hinge on a lot of other factors that may be more beneficial to you as a plaintiff. Um, actual damages are the fee that was lost due to the infringement. Uh, we're talking about profit made by the infringer, possibly including the, the whole entire value of the building. Um, and the copyright owner needs to prove that the infringer's gross revenues uh, the infringer must then prove their expenses and profits from other sources. But here we're talking about a different measurement of damages that could far exceed statutory damages. And these won't always be available to you if you did not register before the infringement. That's why registration is so important and something we want to stress. <clears throat> In fact, there are cases where a house was built without an architect's permission thus causing infringement where the court put a covenant on the land that the entire home could not be sold without that architect's permission. Now, just imagine that were you, if you purchased a home that you now cannot even sell because the architect has final say. Okay, so let's take a look at a hypothetical here. Um, if since your owner, the owner client, hasn't paid your invoices for a few months. Uh, construction's about to start. They send you an email and they tell you they're going to fire you um, and they don't want you to be doing any of the construction administration on the project. What do you do? That's when your contract comes in handy. Um, and it's important to take a look at these provisions, especially if you're using some of the AIA contracts. Uh, fortunately, they're drafted in a way that is protective of architects. Let's take a look at some of these provisions. I paraphrase them here just so that uh, they're a little bit more easily digested. Um, so if you take a look at Article 7 of the B101, you have 7.2, the architects are the copy. That's clear. Um, it's set out in the, there shouldn't be any dispute about that in the agreement. If you look at 7.3, on execution, architect grants the owner license to use the plans to build the building, 
provided the owner performs, which means including paying the architect. And if the architect terminates the contract for a cause, so for instance, not being paid, the license terminates. So remember we talked about one of the things you want to watch out for is a perpetual license. You have a provision here that's going to make it clear that if there's termination for cause, that license is done. 7.3.1, the owner uses the plans without retaining the original architect. The owner is going to release the original architect and indefinitely claims. Remember, we looked at the business and professions code saying that, uh, or sorry, no, not the, the uh, education code that talked about the district potentially using an architect's plans. That's going to be coupled with in indemnification of the architect. So this provision does not apply if the owner rightfully terminates under section 9.4. Basically, the architect failed to perform. So what does that all mean? It means that you, as the architect, own the copyright, and you're allowing the owner to use the plan. That's the license portion to build the, pro the project. But if, you're term if you terminate the, pro the contract, uh, the owner can't use the plans anymore. And if the owner uses the plans without you, then they're going to release you and indemnify you, um, but also maybe set an infringement claim. So let's go back to the hy hypothetical. What can you do? You can terminate the contract for cause. Um, for their failure to perform, that is for failing to pay you, and that terminates their license to use the plans. They go forward without you, you're protected, or you have some protection, um, but on top of that, you're going to have, you may have a potential infringement claim uh, against the owner. So, building your plans without your permission is copying, and it is infringement. This can really come in handy if you have an unfortunate situation where uh, your owner, owner client has decided not to pay you for your work. So it sounds easy, right? Um, yeah, it does, but you gotta be careful also about what you say when you're talking to your client. Um, because there is a concept called an implied license. So um, I'll give you an example. An architect was told that he wasn't going to be working on the project anymore. So he sent his plans to the owner with a note saying, good luck with your project. The court held that that was enough to constitute the architect's permission to build using the architect's plans. So you want to use, you want to avoid using words or engaging in conduct that's going to imply uh, that you've given permission to the owner, you know, even if you have this contract that has pretty clear provisions uh, that govern, govern those issues. And I think that's all we wanted to cover today. Take any questions if anybody has any. I think we're are we done a little bit early. We are. And, yeah. you know, this is probably a lot of information that many of you already knew, but it's always good to have a good a refresher on, on some of the key elements here that we're talking about. Ownership is fairly easy to understand and you always wanna be mindful and track the ownership of the copyright. But the second element of copying in terms of infringement is incredibly subjective. I hope we've been able to demonstrate that today. Um, we always like to say we know when we see it and you'll know when you see it, but you know, opinions do vary and um, as you're out there, you have to be mindful, you have to be careful, and uh, best of luck. You do Does have anybody a couple have any... questions. You have yeah, a couple okay. questions in chat. Shall I read them? Yeah. Yes, please. That would be helpful. Okay. So the first one, if doors were specifically designed with a certain aesthetic, can the doors be copyrighted? <clears throat> the easy answer there is yes. 
even though they are common elements, like every house has a door, the way that doors are used, if they're used uniquely and specifically, it can be an element that is copy, copywritten. Like if somebody took doors and arranged them in like a, in a certain design that was unique to a specific project, the use of the doors, just because it's a common element, doesn't prevent the ability to, to have that be copywritten. Okay, thank you. Second question, how does one know if a napkin sketch is from another registered document? Is there a searchable database to check for incidents such as this? So, yeah, this uh, this ultimately, I think, gets to um, a, a situation that you can actually mitigate. Uh, one, if you have, for instance, an owner like coming to you saying, hey, I've got this idea, check this out. You may want to ask, well, one, where do you get that idea? You know, is this inspired by something? Um, and through hopefully that those sorts of discussions, you would hopefully find out that perhaps this came from somebody else. In which case, um, what you can do is you've got a few options. One, you can try to get permission or, you know, run it by the original architect. Um, the other way to deal with it, too, is to seek some sort of indemnity from the owner, basically having a, a provision in your um, in your contract that's going to protect you in the event that there is some sort of copyright infringement claim. Uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult question. There isn't always a database that you can search, because even if you did search a database, there's a guarantee that it someone else's design. Um, uh, timing becomes an important issue during the fact finding of cases like this. But to Paul's point, you wanna protect yourself the best way you can. As you saw, even though intent doesn't matter with regard to the elements of infringement, it, your state of mind does matter as to damages. And so if it is determined that you ask this person numerous times in emails, written out like, okay, just to confirm, you came up with this design yourself, it didn't come from anybody else, that kind of thing. That's gonna go a long way to, to mitigate your damages um, if this ever becomes a litigated matter. Okay, thank you. And the third one is, can PDF slides be provided to attendees? Yeah, I mean, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, we don't have a problem with that. We certainly don't want you to have to memorize those statutes. So uh, <laughs> if we can provide them to you, we're happy to do so. Yeah. And I see you got your email addresses there. Is it best just to email you directly or do you want to run those through us? They can email us. That's yeah, not a absolutely. problem. Okay. Um, those are the three questions. I'm sure if anybody else has questions, you can take yourself off mute or go ahead and put them in the chat. And again, if you have more specific questions, we're happy to, you know, feel free to reach out to us as well via email. Yeah, I do have a question, just uh, uh, a little bit different from from the main topic. But uh, can uh, can an architect or designer, uh, as a former employee, use uh, plans, sketches, photographs of work that he uh, designed while at the former employer uh, on their website, or to promote or get work uh, as an independent architect? I think you want to be careful there. Um, this touches on the work for hire topic. You know, the work that you did previously belongs to the owner, to your previous employer. If you're only using those works to uh, advertise for yourself, I think the best course of action is to get permission to do so. But the, the technical argument would be that you are not claiming that you know you own that copyright you're just you know showing things that you've worked on um, so you know best practices would be to get permission from your former employer to do so but it's kind of a unique situation where you're not claiming ownership of the work so there shouldn't be a copyright issue there uh, so let me ask you this it's kind of a follow-up to that question then there's another one chat which i'll read afterwards so it, let's say that you do get permission. You work, you previously worked for someone, you're starting your own business, you're creating your website, you want to put some images up there, they give you permission to do so. Should you also write underneath the image 
um, work designed while employed by such and such company. Does that added protection? I would. I would. I think that's smart. You know, um, copyright really also deals with your ability to transfer and to use derivative works and to sell your design. And since you're not necessarily doing that specifically here, you're just trying to show people the work that you've done. Um, you should be fine. Again, best practices are definitely to get permission and to let people know you've gotten permission. So I think your idea is a very good one. And something mm -hmm. to add to that, um, when asking for permission, you can ask about that specifically. Um, you know, licenses can, the contours of a license can vary. Some people might say, yeah, you can use the work that you designed here, but you need to attribute it. You know, or some people say, yeah, fine, I don't care, right? Just so it should be documented, but you can ask that specific question um, to the employer as well. That would be some added right. protection. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we do have another question. If a client assures you in writing that they own the copyright on documents they provide you to use and alter, is that sufficient to satisfy our obligation to confirm copyright ownership? Um, it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, in most cases, I think that is sufficient, but unfortunately there are, you know, very unique circumstances where that might not be enough. Like we said, in, intent specifically is not a element of the pure legal definition of copyright infringement. So even though you receive assurances from owners, um, definitely be meaningful in terms of proving your case and proving the fact that like you meant no harm and you shouldn't have much in the way of damages against you. Um, intent is still not going to be, that wouldn't be enough to prevent the pure, you know, finding that did someone infringe on a copyright. So I, I I know it becomes very, very difficult out there in the real world to, to get the assurances that you need, but, uh, and I certainly recommend that you continue to check with the other party and have that documented um, and certainly search, you know, um, the resources you have available to you to make sure that they're, they're being truthful to you and saying that this is an original idea and concept, but doing a little due diligence is always, I think, recommended. Yeah, to add to that, there's, I don't see why they're, why it wouldn't also be able to reach out to the designer as well. If, well, I suppose if that's an option, then that's worth exploring. I would ask follow-up questions too, um, because if, if the assurance is simply, hey, I own the copyright, um, but you kind of have your suspicions that there might be something else going on, um, then that might not be enough. Um, it might be, that you want to ask for, okay, do you have a contract or something demonstrating that ownership was actually transferred to you as opposed to um, just you telling me, hey, I, I own the, the design. One last thing to add, one, one way to protect yourself from this kind of issue is that in your contract with the client, you make it a specific term that you are relying on their representation that they own the copyright. And if it ever comes to light that they don't, they owe you indemnity for any sort of claims that you have to deal with arising out of that misrepresentation. And then you have them on the hook for a breach of contract. And if you ever get sued for copyright infringement, you simply bring them into the litigation and it be you become an indemnified party and it becomes a problem for that client. Okay, thank you. There uh, are no other questions as of yet. Did I ask a question? I didn't know how to put it into chat. Certainly, I, sure. I was wondering if I have a client who's hired an expediter to help process plans as things have getting, gotten more complicated with water quality, but then they've taken architectural plans and kind of screenshotted them and made them into fire plans and put their logo on. Is that a copyright problem or how do I best work with clients and expediters that are manipulating my plans without my knowledge? 
Um, I certainly think you might have an issue. Um, I'd recommend you reach out to us um, privately and maybe um, give us a little bit more detail and we can, you know, kind of walk you through um, what we think are, are potential issues. But anytime somebody is taking one of your designs, putting their own logo on it, um, I think the inference is that they are trying to suggest it's their work. And that is specifically, uh, you know, copying. And again, we've proven that you own it. You could very much well be dealing with a situation where I think you've, you've satisfied the requirements for establishing copyright infringement.